the predetermination of being set here to do something, and I feel like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm playing pedal steel guitar, you know, and and uh, and everybody says I'm pretty good at it. So it generally started out a six string instrument with no pedals and usually two, two triads, those six strings. They started to make them with multiple necks. So now you could have different tuning. But guys, maybe as early as the 30s and 40s started rigging pedals to their steel guitar among steel guitar players, Bud Isaacs playing pedals on the Webb Pierce record of Slowly set to turn the whole instrument on its head, and everybody had to have pedals. Well, pretty soon the manufacturers got wind of it. Before long, Bigsby, Gibson, and Fender were all building pedal guitars. And so Buddy ordered his and wanted, at first, you had a pedal, one pedal, Bud Isaacs had a pedal, and it, you've got a triad here. Well, this one pedal raised both of those at the same time, where you had an E go to an A. Well, Buddy and Jimmy Day both thought it would be cool to have those on separate pedals. Buddy had split his one way, put, and Jimmy Day had done his vice versa. And so as, even today that persists. You have an Emmons setup or a day setup. And it's like a kaleidoscope, man. It's almost unlimited. It's such an intense instrument, and there's so many different ways you can play a, a song, melodies, with all the copedents and the configurations of the changes with the pedals and the knee levers and the tunings, that it, it's, it's so unique that it makes you, it, it draws you to the other player. It, it brings you to the other steel player. You know, I chased Buddy Emmons and I chased Jimmy Day and, and all the steel players and stuff, you know, and you just, you sit down with the earphones and record and, and, and you play it over and over and over again and you learn the lick, you learn the lick. My biggest influence was probably Buddy Emmons. And I had the pleasure of meeting him when I was about 19 years old. I went to Nashville a fr uh, friend whose band I was in, Bill Green, was doing a session and Buddy was going to be on it and I wanted to go. I, I'll drive the car. And I did. You know, I drove him to Nashville and back pretty much just so I could see Buddy Emmons record. And so before the session, he's got his stuff set up and he's tuning. And I mean, I'm right on top of it. Now on such and such tune here, how did you do this? Man, he'd show me and, uh, and I'd asked him about him and then there was this one great lick that he did and he looked right up at me and he says, well, you can bend the bar and go and he plays this and it's just perfectly and he's looking at me right in the eye and he never looks at steel. Or you can go and he's doing it without slanting the bar. And it was just perfectly clean both ways and he was looking at me in the eye the whole time. So man, I felt like a, uh, like a young sax player getting a lesson from Charlie Parker. Seriously. The inventor of it was Buddy Emmons, and my guitar's an Emmons guitar. And so, Buddy, he gave up in Nashville and before he died. He said, I'm tired of trying to show record producers how versatile this instrument is and how beautiful it is. Guitar players that did all that, they're dying breed. I mean, Buddy Emmons, Jimmy Day, uh, Curly Chalker, Al Rugg, all those guys that created all that 60s and 70s music in Nashville, they're all dead. And that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to keep their legacy going, you know. But I'm an old school guy. I grew up listening to Ernest Tubb and the Texas Troubadours and Ray Price, and all my friends in school were listening to ACDC and Aerosmith and all that, and they didn't get me, you know. Blake Shelton made a comment when I was with Gene Watson. He said, we don't want to hear your granddaddy's music anymore, okay? 
and he told that to Ray Price, and he told that to Gene Watson. And let me tell you what, Blake Shelton had to come make an public apology. My work for Watson, we had been made members of the Opry, he, and, and we were packing them in everywhere we played. And people were lining up to see Gene Watson. 60 years in the music business he's been. And what I did is I tried to, I tried to copy what they did when they made the record. I tried to copy what it was going, and he loved it. Because he said, oh, I know exactly what you're doing, and it sounds just like 1974 or 75, and that was my goal, was to make him sound like he did when he first started out, you know. That was the whole deal. Well, I would hate to see this thing die off. When we were kids, we heard Ray Price records and Charlie Pride, Loretta Lynn, all had a lot of steel and a lot of good steel on it. When I go in a place and they have a modern country radio station on the system and I'm eating lunch or whatever and I haven't listened to song after song after song, very seldom do I hear something like, man, I got to get that record and learn that solo. So kids my age, when I was learning to play, man, we wanted to do that because we could hear it all over the radio and, and we knew what it was. Nowadays, you, 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 they squeeze a little bit in there enough so they can label it country, but it's basically rock and roll. What I do is traditional, hardcore country music. What, is, what does that mean to you know, keep that tradition around? Oh, look at this place. Look at this place and these people. When we did our first song, the dance floor, and everybody tonight that I've talked to has told me, Oh my God, we aren't hearing this anymore. We're not getting this. And, that, and that, 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 that tells me I've done what I'm supposed to do. You know, I'm doing my job. There's a quote in the Bible that says, let there be music and be with a 10 string heart. And that's what I play. The top neck's got 10 and the back neck's got 10. And it's like God said, hey, this is it right here.